You're listening to a podcast from 702 and Cape Talk. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist. And our lines are open for you. Give us a call on 021-446-0567-011-883-0702. We're taking your SMSs. What do you want to ask the Naked Scientist today? We are satisfying our curiosity about the world in which we live. And, of course, we're building up to our live annual um, interaction with him in front of a live audience. We'll give you details as soon as everything has been confirmed. But it's definitely happening. Again, uh, the Naked Scientist will be at the Rand Easter show as well for that uh, uh, Easter weekend will give you those details. So lots to look forward to there. Chris, good morning. Good morning. Well, I see the story about a handshake that we all do it. There's yeah. no denying it. I'm the exception. <laughs> I don't shake hands. <laughs> well, it's not just shaking hands that we all do. Yeah. Or pretty much most does, people. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it, it's actually what we do next because there's a researcher at the um, Weizmann Institute in Israel. His name is Idan Frumin. And he has published a paper in the journal eLife where he said, well, we had, th- we had heard that people do something interesting after they shake hands with each other, so we thought we'd put it to the scientific test, and they have. Mm. And that thing is that when people shake hands with somebody else, in the few minutes after they've shaken hands, what they actually do is sniff their fingers. And <laughs> they found this by inviting people to their laboratory under the auspices of taking part in a scientific study and put secret cameras up and people didn't know they were being filmed at least at the start of the study and an experimenter would walk into the room and was randomized either to shake hands with the person and say hello or just to walk in and say hello and the researchers watched where the person's right hand versus their left hand that's the right hand being the one that was shaken where that went in the ensuing couple of minutes Mm -hmm. And what they found is that the right hand that was shaken, when it was shaken, but not when it wasn't shaken, spent significantly more time in the vicinity of the nose after the shake. (laughs) And the other thing they did was to prove that a number of things happen. One is that when people shake hands like this, that they definitely sniff. Hmm. They were able to show air going up the nose uh, when people bring their fingers to their face like this. They were also able to show that there are transfers of chemicals from one hand to the other because they did the experiment with an experimenter wearing a glove that they could also then put into an analyzer and show that there were chemicals coming off of the hand of the person doing the shaking onto the glove proving that you're transmitting chemicals between the two of you when you shake hands and as Edan Freeman put it to me this is basically the human equivalent of what dogs do when they meet each other but it's a bit more socially acceptable (laughs) <laughs> very, very interesting indeed. I'm going to be observing that uh, now more than ever. Let's go to, uh, is it Charles in Kensington? Hi. Yes, good morning, Reddy. Good morning. Yeah, I just wanted to ask the medical scientists how the satellites and the space station keep within Earth's orbit without wandering off into deep space. And Charles, well, the answer is all down to gravity, a wonderful invention from Cambridge, in fact. Isaac Newton, a few hundred years ago, discovered apocryphally because an apple fell on his head but it's not actually true no apple ever did fall on newton's head he, mm-hmm. he just agreed to to live with the story because it was a good one <laughs> uh, but the answer is that things are attracted to massive objects because they have gravity so the earth is a massive object it has a lot of mass which means it bends the fabric of space space time and things therefore feel a force towards that object so you have a satellite including the Earth's biggest natural satellite, which is the Moon, it has mass. The Earth has mass. Those two masses are attracted by gravity. And because the objects are trying to move in a straight line, but gravity is pulling on them, they actually go always in a circle. So they're falling towards the Earth all the time, but the circle they're moving in is a bigger circle than the surface circle of the Earth, and therefore they they fall towards the Earth all the time, but always miss and go around in a circle. Okay, thank you very much, Charles. Lovely question. Shall we go to uh, Stephen in Rodiport? Good morning. Hi, good morning, guys. How, how's it? All good, Stephen. Your question, please. Very well, yes. Um, I've noticed something strange about my body, right? I don't know if it happens with me alone, but um, I haven't really asked my friends or my peers. I, I tend to pay a lot of attention to my left hand rather than to my right hand. And as a result, I've noticed that my fingernails grow quicker on my left hand than my right hand? Is it because I, I pay attention to it? What happens? I'll listen on the radio. 
Well, fingernails grow at, um, it's a few millimetres every month or so. It's about the same speed that tectonic plates move on the earth, actually. Mm. And the f toenails are the same. Fingernails are made of the protein keratin, and you have cells in the plate at the base of the nail which are laying down this keratin protein, same stuff your hair's made of, and they slowly push the nail outwards uh, over the nail bed. And we have these structures because they, they actually make doing fine manipulation easier because they stabilise and strengthen the ends of your fingers and toes. But the nail wears down because it is just made of this fibrous protein, keratin. And the more you do with your fingers, the more wear and tear there will be. So if you are using your right hand more than your left hand, for example, the nails there will wear slightly faster than the ones on the left. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that your overall body nutritional status will affect the rate of nail growth. So people who are well nourished, people who eat a good healthy diet with lots of protein in it, they're going to have faster nail and hair growth. People who are unwell for some reason, certain drugs, chemotherapy, being systemically unwell, mm. chronic infections, that kind of thing will, will slow down nail growth. Uh, and so basically your nails are growing at a, a pretty standard rate. This will in increase a bit if you have good nutrition. It will decrease a bit if you have poor nutrition or other illness and wear and tear will file the nails off. And that will happen to potentially asymmetrically depending on what you do with the body part concerned. And uh, is it Michael in Sunning Hill? Hi. Hi, Rudy. Mm. Yeah, and your guest. I, my question is, what is the stuff that's burning on the, from the fat? In other words, is it, is it gas? Is it coal? Um, when are we going to reach a total blackout? Okay. And occasionally there are explosions <clears throat> from the sun. What is that all about? Uh, yes, right. So the sun is a massive ball of gas in the sky. It's m mostly made at the moment of hydrogen. When it, when it first began, it was almost all hydrogen. And the hydrogen is fusing by the process of nuclear fusion. Four hydrogen atoms glue themselves together under the intense heat and pressure of the sun's condition inside to make an atom of helium. And because there is a disparity in the mass between four hydrogen atoms and, four, and, and one atom of helium, that mass difference is the energy that the sun gives off because when you stick particles together, then you get some energy out. And that energy uh, comes radiating out from the sun as photons of light, effectively, and they come through space towards us. And some of those photons are visible light that makes the light that we see by. Some of them are invisible light called infrared, which we experience as heat. There are also other forms of radiation as well that come off the sun. But those, those forms of radiation keep the Earth nice and warm, and the visible light, when it hits the Earth's surface, it hits the Earth's surface with a rate of about one kilowatt per square metre, so a thousand watts on every square metre. This uh, is absorbed by the Earth's surface, warms up the Earth's surface, and then gets re-radiated as infrared heat back out from the Earth's surface. So that's why the Earth warms up in the presence of sunlight and then keeps itself nice and warm. And even when night comes and there's no sunlight hitting the surface of the Earth, it doesn't go completely cold straight away because there's still some of that latent heat mm -hmm. in the Earth's surface. The explosions on the surface of the sun that are mentioned, yes, you do get these things. Uh, you get solar flares and what are called coronal mass ejections. These occur because the sun has um, a magnetic field this magnetic field is twisting and turning because the sun is itself turning and the surface of the sun is turning at a slightly different rate to the innards of the sun and this can lead to almost like a corkscrewing effect of the magnetic field which can get very, very tightly wound and then it flings surface material from the sun out into space in a big sort of cosmic burp which convulsively expels this material out from the surface of the sun and it comes racing across space mm -hmm. and, uh, and actually can annihilate anything in its path. Little ones are capable of causing disruption to satellites and our power grids and electronic systems on Earth. Big ones can actually wipe out whole power grids and, and destroy satellites and things like that. So that's why uh, the UK has actually started a space weather forecasting program now. In the last 12 months, um, we launched a space weather system um, pro um, forecasting system so that uh, scientists are keeping an eye on what the sun's doing so that because mm -hmm. we're so heavily reliant on the technologies that could be damaged by this sort of radiation, um, we, we, can be, we can warn people who run these satellites and things so they can shut down sensitive systems well ahead of the arrival of one of these uh, explosions so that we minimise the damage. Ndina and Gavin, stay on the line. I'll be back with you in a moment. 702 and Cape Talk. The Naked Scientist.
021-446-0567 or double one double eight three zero seven zero two. Ndina in Pretoria, hi. Uh, good day, Rudy and Chris. Mm-hmm. Um, my question is, there's been a scary study that that shows the sugar that we, we drink on our fizzy drink, like grape, it has nine teaspoons of sugar. But if I put that sugar on water or in a 250 ml of water or tea, I won't be able to tolerate it. Is mm. there a process that they use uh, mm. to make the fizzy drink that we drink for us to tolerate that sugar? Jeez, that's very interesting. Hey, So the same amount of sugar that you can tolerate in a fizzy drink, why are you not able to tolerate it in a cup of tea or coffee? I think it's what we get used to, and it's a really important point you make, and thank you for raising it, yes. because these fizzy drinks have got a lot to answer for, actually, because they they pack a massive calorie punch, and we just don't realise it. You tip down one of these drinks, and there are hundreds and hundreds of calories in there, and because you're thirsty and you're drinking for a liquid refreshment rather than energy, all that energy is sort of empty calories. You just eat all this, all this, or you take in this huge burden of calories that you didn't need because you weren't hungry, you were just thirsty. And you're quite right that if you were to put that much sugar in tea and coffee, it would be so insipid that you would say, ugh, that's disgusting. But because of the formulation of the drink, it's actually blended to taste good and we, we all like them. And that's because there's a whole range of different things about that. You don't have fizzy tea or coffee, perish the thought, that would be disgusting. Yeah. But in the context of a fizzy drink, which is a very different sort of consistency in your mouth, it's a different flavour profile, and we expect it to taste differently, you can get away with a huge amount of sugar in there. And you should be really careful, everybody. I mean, I, I do not drink these things anymore, mm. because when I looked up how many calories are in there, and you think, this is, this is giving you a massive sugar hit, and it then causes a massive massive surge of insulin to come out of your pancreas and it turns all of that sugar instantly into flab and it's really bad so either drink the ones that don't have all that sugar in or just drink or just water it's probably them. better for you and then they're really bad for your teeth as well i mean this is the other thing that mm. this much sugar is bacteria food and you put this into your mouth and the bugs that live in your mouth have a complete banquet of all this sugar and they turn the sugar into acid in your mouth which erodes your teeth if you keep drinking these things sustainably you slowly select for bacteria in your mouth that rot your teeth really well because mm. they're really good at turning the sugar into acid and these fizzy drinks are in and of themselves quite acidy. They've got phosphoric acid, they've also got uh, carbonic acid, obviously, because there's a lot of dissolved carbon dioxide to make them fizzy. And these things mean, mean that they're very acidic and they do dissolve your teeth. Mm, absolutely, absolutely. Here, here, everyone. Would the same go for energy drinks? Well, it depends what's in them, but the, usually the reason they're an energy drink, and, and this is a little bit of a dodgy market because the labelling and branding and marketing is quite crafty, so you've got to read the label, but energy equals calories, and if yes, if you're exercising and you need a surge of energy because you've just burned a 1,000 calories doing the marathon like you were <laughs> running recently, really, um, then Yes, that's fine. But if you are just sitting there watching the match on television or watching someone else do a lot of physical exercise and you're just relaxing and you want a nice drink because it's a hot day, Mm. you don't need all those calories. You're just burning 60 calories an hour sitting in your armchair and you do not need 500 calories in one of these drinks because you don't need them and you won't, you will just turn that into fat. Um, not you personally, Reedy, obviously, I mean, everybody. <laughs> but, you know, that that's the point, that we just don't see this massive energy punch that these things are packing. And we are enormously over-consuming in our daily lives because there's all these hidden calories in, in stuff. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Ndina. Let's go to, is it uh, Chris in the southwest of France uh, phoning us? Good morning. Morning, Rudy. Morning, Chris. How are you? We all well. Your question, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for a really great show. Rudy, uh, Chris, dreams. Uh, it's my understanding that people can only dream of things that they've seen, physically, visually seen. So, I think my first question is, blind, people who are born blind, can they dream? And at what stage, oh, how does your brain mix up all the pictures that it's seen? Thank you very much. I'll listen on uh, the computer. <laughs> That's the first, isn't it? Yeah. The south of France. We didn't ask him where he is. Yes. Uh, we, should, we should ask him if he's on holiday. Um, when you dream, this is a specific stage of sleep. 
and it's what's called REM or rapid eye movement sleep. You can tell when people are dreaming if you watch their eyes beneath their eyelids, they're moving around. And if you record their brain waves when they're in that pe 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 stage, you will see there's an intense pattern of, of brain activity almost as excitable as when a person is awake. And this is because periodically through the night, your brain goes through cycles of intense activity, which we now understand if you wake people up when they're in this situation and you ask them, were you dreaming? They tend to say yes. So we know that this rapid eye movement sleep corresponds to dream time. If you look at which bits of the brain are becoming active during these dreams, you switch on the same regions of brain that you would use to do different jobs with your brain during the day because the, the brain is specialised in different areas to do different jobs. When you go to sleep and you dream, those same areas which you process incoming information with during the day when you're awake and conscious, they switch on and they recreate or play through some of your past experiences. They create novel experiences and new experiences. So you, you can imagine yourself in situations that you've never been in because your brain can invent that for you. But it seems very real because basically the same brain areas that are making those things available to your consciousness during the day when you're really experiencing, they're just turning on and recreating those experiences for you even though you're not doing them. To answer the question about blindness, this is an interesting one because I, I've had a number of blind friends over the years and I've asked them this very question. People who have gone blind later in life will tell you that actually they love going to sleep. In the words of one of my blind friends, I mm -hmm. love going to sleep because I can see again. Mm -hmm. and, and especially experiencing colours. A lot of blind people who've gone blind later in life will say that they miss being able to experience and discriminate different colours. And when you go to sleep and, and you, you activate your visual system, because that's still perfectly functional inside your brain, um, unless you've had a stroke or something, and that's why you've gone blind, then you can recreate these visual experiences you had had previously. And so you can see again in your sleep. People who have never been able to see nonetheless still of course dream mm. and they tend to report that their experiences are dominated by sounds and, and speech and that kind of thing so in other words your brain recreates the world that you live in for you when you go to sleep and if your world is dominated by a touch sound and smell world then that tends to be the sort of thing you ex experience in your dreams who came in first i think it was gavin gavin in gardens good morning hi good morning to both of you good morning um i'd like to find out um 1998, I bought three soda cans, um, each about 200 mils, and they've been sitting in a room, uh, no heat, no cold or anything particular, and the other day I went to them, and the liquid has vanished out of all three cans. They've never been opened, never been touched. The, the liquid is gone. I wonder if you had an explanation for that. Whoa. <laughs> so they're what, three fizzy drinks cans? They, 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 each can is about 200 milliliters. They're small, quite small cans. Yeah, and over 17 oh, years. Over and 17 they were, years. They were, they were fizzy uh, drinks, were they? They were fizzy drinks, yeah. On the bottom yeah. of the one can, I looked, and I could see microscopic, what I would call like sugar, that looks like residue almost, but a tiny, tiny fraction of a mouth, not even a, a fifth of, of a teaspoon. But the rest are completely empty, and there's no holes or there's nothing. Although you say there's no holes, um, mm -hmm. and we'll assume that they were full when you first bought them, and that this is not a trick, but although you say that, that there are no holes, there probably are, and the fact you can see that residue strongly argues that there has been a very, very small leak, and, and I suspect, were they the old-fashioned ring pull type cans? Because one possibility is that, that there was a very, very tiny hole, and because of heating effects, if they're standing on a windowsill or something, or in a room that gets hot in summer, then... The, the, there will be expansion and contraction of the material that the can is made of and this may have opened up a very tiny aperture just in one point on the tin and slowly over enough time you just evaporate off the contents of the tin mm -hmm. and it might be worth opening them up and seeing because if, if evaporation has happened then all the sugar and other things that were in there will have been left behind and the liquid the mainly water will have just evaporated off if there's a hole in the bottom of the tin then it will have just dribbled out very very slowly and slowly evaporated off the surface um mm -hmm. i think also that uh, it may be that they've corroded if they were steel tins um, I, excuse the kind of slight dodgy use of language there, steel tin. But if they were made of steel, then the acid in the contents could have eroded through that and caused it caused the hole. If uh, if they weren't steel tins, they're aluminium. They can still degrade a little bit, and that may be what's happened. And so my money would be on a tiny hole, and they've slowly emptied because of evaporation of the contents.
Thanks, Gavin. Uh, did you just do this as an experiment, Gavin? Sorry? Did you just collect these um, cans as an, as an experiment? These no, no, no. I, I bought them because they were, uh, they were, they were, they had like Batman, um, there was some sort of limited edition oh, Batman Oh, okay, so you wanted to keep them. I was, I was overseas and I saw them, I thought I'd, I would, I would, I would keep them. And then, okay. uh, as I said, yeah, I just suddenly noticed that there's nothing in them anymore. All right. Thank you. I was just <laughs> curious. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> Tulani in Pretoria, hi. Hi, hi, Rudy. Um, I want to find out what happens to a child when they are born. Some of them, they they, they hear, they can hear. But um, if, for instance, a couple fights fight a lot, and then they tend, uh, you know, they they can't hear anymore. They, you know, they just tend deaf. What happens during that time when when the, the couple makes noise and fight and so on? Because they, oh, I see. Well, I, I yes, I, I know. I know what you mean. Because there are some instances where children can become almost deaf and mute, don't they? And they stop responding. And I think this is because of trauma. And there's some evidence that children are very, very sensitive to um, if they see their parents upset or they see people scared and concerned and hurt around them, then it's almost like a defense mechanism. Sometimes children can go into a sort of a, a non-responsive state. They, they refuse to hear anything and they refuse to engage or, or talk to people because they've been traumatized and they wow. become terrified and scared. Um, this is quite rare, but uh, it's, it's certainly a very Im- Im- important point to make that uh, children are like sponges and they see and hear everything that goes on around them and they don't necessarily have the experience that an adult does or of course they don't have the experience of, of, uh, of dealing with the world in the way that an adult does. So they don't see things from an adult's perspective. They just see two people they love and care about rowing or um, getting angry with each other and they don't understand that this is just a minor argument or a fracas or something and as a result... Uh, they, they tend to internalise this and it can become a severe psychological problem. And so it's very important to make sure that children um, don't get exposed to this kind of thing because they're not really equipped intellectually to understand mm. what's going on. Chris, we'll see you again next week then. Oh, I'm really looking forward to it. And it's not long till I'm, till I'm with you. It's three weeks, so actually, it's gonna less be than good. three weeks. Yeah, no, yeah, it's going to be good, isn't it? We look forward to that and uh, interacting with our listeners. Always great fun.